Okay, it's time for our first interview. I'm joined by rebel capitalist George Gammon. We're going to talk about real estate, the Fed, QE, and more. Welcome to the show, George. Patrick, I am super stoked to be here. I love the show. I cannot wait to deliver some value to your audience. I'm, I'm uh, really excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, you know what, George, I was looking forward to this. Uh, I always enjoy our conversations. So let's jump into it. But before, like, I know we're going to talk Fed and QE and bailouts and oh, all sorts yeah. of great stuff. Oh, yeah. But but you know what? Uh, very few people ever get to hear uh, your story. Uh, you know, uh, how did you get into all of this? Uh, why don't we start off like, uh, uh, where'd you grow up? Uh, where'd you go to school? How did you get in the business? Well, I grew up in Portland, Oregon. And back in the, the 70s and 80s, it was a lot different back then. There was uh, there wasn't as much Antifa, believe it or not, right. <laughs> back in the 70s and 80s in, in Portland, Oregon. But uh, just was um, I, I played a lot of sports growing up. I played ice hockey, which I'm nice. sure you can appreciate being yes. Canadian. Uh, what was funny about that is is I was on the All Star team when I was in Pee Wee's. And right. for those people that might not know what age group that is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Patrick, but I think it's it's uh, to ten or eleven to fourteen, is it, or twelve something to fourteen? Something like that. Yeah. Something. Anyway, we were in Pee Wee's, and I was on our All Star team for Portland. You had to try out for it and everything, so it's kind of a big deal. You know, you make it, you feel like a big shot. And we would go up and play Spokane and Seattle, and we would do very well. And then occasionally we would take a road trip up to Canada. And nice. then we would get the the dose or the dish of humble pie handed to <laughs> us. <laughs> we would think we're big stuff. We would go up there and just get rocked like 15 to nothing. And uh, we went to Burnaby a few times in Victoria. So yeah. whenever we go to Canada, we would just... Canadians get... take their hockey pretty seriously. It's, boy, uh, oh boy. It's, a, it's a whole new level. <laughs> it sure is. It sure is. So I just, just played a, a lot of sports growing up. And in high school, I was just a, a terrible, terrible student. In fact, I tell people all the time that I almost flunked out of high school. Uh, I remember my final semester, I had uh, my whole entire report card, I think it was two Ds and two Fs. And the only reason I got the two Ds is because those were the two classes I needed to graduate. Uh, so I was a horrible, horrible student. I actually did go to college, though. I went to college uh, for an, an athletic scholarship. If you want to call golf athletics, I don't know if you want to <laughs> go that far. Most people wouldn't really consider it a sport. But if you do, uh, then I went to college on, a, on an athletic scholarship. And I actually did a little bit better in college as far as grades go. But then when I got out of college, uh, first thing I did is I started a business. It was a t-shirt business. And I was working valet at the Golden Nugget. In Vegas. <laughs> nice. And I was working the graveyard shift because that would give me time during the day to work on my t shirt business. And I could just take all the tips from what I made working valet and just in, uh, invest that into the business. So I was doing that. Of course, I didn't make any money. And uh, that kind of went belly up. But that was my first uh, kind of my first shot at being an entrepreneur and I just stuck with it. I worked for a couple of different groups and uh, just kind of went back and forth, just learning how to become better in business. And then I started consulting in the early 2000s. Uh, this was with uh, radio advertising, writing radio copy, which now helps me out quite a bit with the, uh, with the YouTube channel and uh, just had some successes. I had some failures. The last business that I started was in 2008, and uh, we were fortunate enough to grow that to $24 million in revenues. And 2012, I had grown that business all over the world, pretty much every English-speaking country you can think of. And I was on a flight from L.A. to Australia, and about a 14-hour flight, and it was, I, I had built this monster and I had become a slave to the monster. And what I'm referring to is the business. Right. And this was, and this was not my first business. I had, I had, I had started and took over many of them, but this was kind of the last one. And it, it turned out to be the biggest, but I, and I had over a hundred employees at the time, believe it or not. And I just realized that I had a lot less personal freedom than I did 
when I was in college and I didn't have two nickels to rub together. So I thought, so I said, well, you know, what's the point of making all this money when you have less freedom? I mean, isn't that the point? Yeah. And I had a, a mentor, if you want to call it that, a, a guy that I worked with, I partnered with on a couple of deals. And this was back when I was in my uh, early 30s. And so I, I was very young for, for what I was doing at the time. And he was in his late 60s. He was a, a former CEO of some companies in Silicon Valley, insurance companies. And he always said to me, money can't buy happiness, but it buys you a hell of a lot of freedom. <laughs> so if you're someone who uh, is, is happier, the more free you are, then there's obviously a correlation there with the amount of money you're making. So anyway, uh, on that flight, I said, listen, I need to take some time off. So I was going to take six months off and I just ended up just calling it quits. And I uh, retired when I was 38 years old in 2012. And then I, I had, I was fortunate to have a, a decent amount of money, but I knew that I needed to invest it well to, so I wouldn't have to ever work again if I didn't want to. And I knew nothing about investing. And when I say nothing, I mean zero. I didn't know what the Fed was. I didn't know what a yield curve was. I didn't even know what interest rates were. I'd never owned a piece of property. I, I knew nothing except for how to make money in business. And I did that well, but <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, you're moving on to the next stage of life. So I just dove into every type of investment philosophy or anything on YouTube or podcasts that I could get my hands on. And I was in the Marina Bay Sands in Singapore. I was there. It's one of my favorite hotels. I love Singapore. I was about 15 minutes before I was supposed to meet someone for dinner. And I was in my hotel room, remember it like it was yesterday, on YouTube. And I stumbled across a video from Milton Friedman's Free to Choose series. And it just blew me away. I mean, I, I just was almost in a state of shock because he was articulating so well everything that had been in my head for so long and all the experiences that I had as not only an entrepreneur and an employer, but also an employee when I was in college. And I, that just took me right down the rabbit hole. I, I From Friedman, I went to Thomas Sowell. And then I started get in, getting into more of the investors that kind of see things in that way, the Austrian school type investors, if you will. So guys like Schiff, uh, Jim Rogers, Jim Grant, uh, Jim Rickards, Doug Casey, Rick Rule, all these guys. And I was just, I was hooked. I was hooked. And when I get into something, I get just completely OCD on it. So if I'm in the shower, if <laughs> welcome I'm to the club. <laughs> breakfast, yeah. If I'm jogging, if I'm in the gym, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'm listening to a podcast like Macro Voices or a, a Real Vision. And back then, it was audio books and YouTube interviews with Jim Rogers or Mark Faber. And um, I thought, okay, this is this really resonates with me. So then I stumbled across a chart, and this is before I got to invest, investing. Now we're maybe mid two thousand twelve. I stumbled across a chart of the Japanese housing market going back prior to their bust in nineteen ninety, and I saw that from the the top to the bottom, they lost about sixty percent. And if you remember, this was the time when the U.S. market was still actually going down and people thought real estate was the worst investment in the world. It's going to keep going down. No one's going to touch real estate with a 10 foot pole. Banks were selling foreclosure properties and short sales and all these things were pennies on the dollar. And it was just a hated asset class. It's almost like uranium is now or yeah. something like that. Right. And so I pulled up a chart of the United States housing market. And I saw going all the way back to 1900, when you adjust for inflation, the size of the home, that we were almost bouncing on our historic trend line. So I thought, ah, OK, well, this housing stuff is kind of like it might be cheap, like Jim Rogers would probably be interested in something like this because there's blood in the streets and people are giving it away. And that was honestly my mindset. So I compared that to the chart of Japan. I thought, well, my downside is probably only 10% because that's what happened to Japan. And if I'm buying it for the cash flow, 
well, what do I care what happens to the price of the asset? I'm not planning on selling it. So if I can get super cheap cash flow to 10 or 12 or even 14% return using right. no leverage, and I can build some equity by buying some piece of crap property from the bank, but then dropping 25 on a remodel. So now you've got that forced equity if they want or forced appreciation, the real estate guys would call it. And I thought, well, this is probably a good deal. So that's what got me into real estate investing. And the very first thing I did is I I went to Kansas City. I had some friends there. That's another long story. I was dating a gal. She was a model up in uh, New York City, but her family was from Kansas City. So that was kind of an equal point because I was in Vegas. She was there. So we'd always meet in Kansas city. Anyway, her family was in the construction business and they were telling me about all these tax foreclosure homes you could get for like five grand. And I'm like 5,000 bucks for a house. I'm like, what's the catch? You know, why is everyone going there bidding up the price? So I did some research I found out why you could get a house for $5,000 because you're probably overpaying for it. <laughs> and uh, But I thought, okay, this could be cool. So I went to the gal's family. I said, listen, you guys do all the work. I'll put up the money. I'll buy the properties. I'll put up all the money for the rehab and then we'll split profits. And they said, yeah, that sounds fantastic. So we went to the first tax foreclosure auction and that's when the county forecloses on someone for not paying their property taxes. Right. And I bought six houses. Boom, done. And a, a funny story about that is prior to doing, you know, I'd never done this before. So doing due diligence, I went to the the person that's in charge there for the county. I said, okay, well, how does this work? They explained it to me. And they said, if you win the auction, if you're the high bidder, right then and there, you've got to pay cash. And if you don't have the money, you don't pay right then and there, then it just goes to the next uh, bidder. And I said, right. Well, like what? Okay. So like literally like a, a bag full of cash? Like you, you. Well, see, the, you, you, you're thinking the same thing I did. That's what I thought. So yeah. I, I fortunately or not, whatever, I, I had a bunch of cash back in Vegas in my safe. And so <laughs> I, I went back to Vegas <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm going to allocate like 150 grand to this. So I took like 200 grand. I put it in a backpack. <laughs> And I was, and at the time, I had two vehicles. Oh, I agree with a motorcycle. I had this uh, Mercedes, a, a, an AMG Mercedes, and then I had a, a um, what I had at the time. Oh, and then I had a Ferrari. I had a Ferrari, okay. a convertible Ferrari. And I, what happened is, just before I went, I noticed the tags on my Mercedes were expired. I'm like, listen, I don't want to take my my Mercedes because. You know, you got 200 grand in a bag. I mean, who knows what happens? And I already had a gun with me, you know, just in case, because you start to wonder about, man, yeah. you know, people kill other people for like 10 grand. So if someone found out I had 200 grand right here in a backpack, that might not be good. <laughs> so I'm like, I, there's no way I can take the Mercedes, but I just bought my mom a smart car. You know what those are? Uh, I, I've heard of them. Those little teeny weeny weeny uh, things no, oh. that you see. You see them in Italy all the time. And like, I mean, the, the like tires are like only like one foot uh, in diameter type of thing. Like yeah, just small little little tiny, it looks like a slice of cheese or like a Rubik's <laughs> cube with like a little couple <laughs> wheels on it. Right. So I'm like, so you're taking this thing and you're, yeah, you're, so pack, you're packing a gun with 200 grand. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, you're, yeah look, like you're looking for a drug deal or something. <laughs> Yeah, and I threw it in the back of the smart car, and I drove the smart car to um, to Kansas City from Vegas, right? And but what what dawned on me when I was driving the smart car, I I go by a cop, Patrick, at like eighty miles per hour over the speed limit in the U.S. And I would, and you know, you look at, and you know, when you see that cop, you're like, oh shoot, he's gonna get me, ah, oh, he's he's got me. And then you're always looking through your rearview mirror yeah. to see if he pulls out, and. The, the first time that happened, the pop, the cop didn't do anything. And it dawned on me like, this is the perfect vehicle. Like nobody is ever going to expect something that's happening or I'm doing anything wrong or I've got cash <laughs> with, a, with a little tiny smart car. You know, it's like the nerdiest hipster kind of millennial car on the planet earth. So they're not going to expect me of, <laughs> of doing anything. So anyway, I got it to Kansas city first day of the auction. I had this 200,000 in cash in my bag, roughly. And I, I, I was a bidding on a property. I won it. Right. And I think I paid like 30 grand for it or something like that. So I go up to the, and it's all, there's a courthouse steps. It's very similar to what you would imagine or what you see on TV yeah. on the courthouse steps. They set up a little table right next to the auctioneer 
where they've got the actual titles or the slips of your receipt so you can get the title for the house. And you go up there. So I went up there, bam, put my backpack down on the on the table, and I start breaking out this cash. And everyone's looking at me like, what is this guy doing? And they had these security guys, and they're kind of like whispering back and forth. I'm like, like this is what I'm supposed to do, right? And then this guy, you know, taps me on the shoulder. He's like, dude, you sh- you're not supposed to bring cash. I'm like, that's what the gal told me to. They had no, no, no. You bring cashier's checks. I'm like, oh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so then, of course, everyone, you know, the, the 20 or 30 people that are there uh, bidding, then all of a sudden I go back once I get the property. I have this big backpack and they know that it's just jam packed full of cash. So everyone's kind of looking at me weird. But that was uh, the funny story of my of my uh you know, my initiation into real estate investing. That's hilarious. And so uh, now, uh, and then since then, I mean, that, that was what, back 2012 or something like that? Yeah, that was 2012. And I, I just figured out the real estate game. I did a few flips. I kept a lot of properties in a rental portfolio. Uh, a lot of those properties I, I actually still have. And when I was an entrepreneur, I made quite a bit of money overseas. And mm-hmm. so when I, figured out the real estate game in the US, the natural progression for me was like, listen, if I can increase my margins, if I can get a better ROI outside the United States, I'm game. So, and I love to travel. I've been over to, uh, to over 40 countries. I've, I've lived all over the place. So that was a very easy transition for me. So I went down to South America because now all of a sudden I'm starting to learn more and more about macro as I'm yeah. doing the real estate stuff. And I thought that we would get some inflation and that the CPI was understated. So we had all these retire or these baby boomers retiring. And I thought their purchasing power is going to get squeezed. So they might look to move outside of the United States to increase their uh, standard of living or their purchasing power if they're on fixed income like Social Security. Yeah. So I went down to Ecuador and that seemed to be a good fit. But that's when I made the biggest mistake that I've ever made in investing. And I'm, I'm so glad that I made it. I got my butt handed to me. But it really helped solidify my framework that I have today for investing that I've used very successfully. And the mistake I made back then, because I didn't know any different, is I saw an asset class that was increasing in value that, that was pretty hot. And it definitely wasn't hated. It definitely wasn't cheap. But I felt as though it was going to get a lot more expensive. Right. And so I went ahead and bought it. I bought this a b- bunch of oceanfront property in, uh, in Ecuador. Well, as it turns out, that was not a good play. They had uh, an earthquake or a volcano. They had a new president come in. And um, I've got some of the property, but the property that I've actually sold and liquidated, I've taken a massive haircut, you know, probably a 50% haircut on it. And wow. the big mistake that I made there is I bought expensive, hoping that the asset would get even more expensive or I could find like a greater fool. And I just kind of got sucked up. That's into- sort of like the way the stock market works today, though. That's a, it makes it challenging for you with that experience, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it's it's definitely the way the stock market works and, and it, or, or the way it's working. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I see. And now I preach till I'm blue in the face that you've got to buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're expensive. And, uh, and I've done that quite consistently. True value investor. What's ironic is I did that in 2012 without even knowing it. Well, yeah. I, it without back then, you know, I really didn't have a framework. It's just, I wanted to do what Jim Rogers did. And I knew yeah. that Jim Rogers bought stuff when no one wanted it. And when it was cheap. So I did it in 2012, but I didn't really make it a rule. Yeah. And after I made the mistake in Ecuador, I made that a rule of investing for myself. And since that time, I've made a lot of money by in real estate in in other areas by keeping that mentality that you just you got to buy things when they're cheap. And if you're considering purchasing an asset and all of your buddies and all your family members are telling you that you're absolutely insane. Like George, what are you doing? Are you out of your mind? It's almost like an an 
AA intervention, right? Where you're an <laughs> alcoholic and your whole family waits for you at the house till you come in and then they're like, <laughs> you really need therapy. We're going to stop you from, from, uh, you know, being your own worst enemy. And it was, if your friends aren't doing that, when you're looking at a long-term investment and a long-term investment, you might want to think twice, but yeah. if your friend, if you tell all your friends and family members, what you're considering and they're like, Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, that's a fantastic idea. You know what? I was just thinking about doing that myself and I was talking to my wife about doing it. Yeah. We're gung ho. Let's, in fact, we can do this together. And Oh, and as a matter of fact, all my buddies down at the, at the, at the police station or wherever you, or wherever you work yeah. at the office, they're thinking about doing X, Y, Z. That's when you need to take a, pause and time out say wait a minute here am i on the wrong side of the boat and that's what i really try to to preach now on the youtube channel and to everyone and but it's yeah. so difficult for people patrick because they get hyper fixated on the direction of the price of xyz or what direction is the market going and if they could just get that out of their head and, and just forget about it and only focus on on the value proposition, yeah. they would do so much better. And I, I forgot to tell the story, but um, when I was struggling in business, when I first started, before I had some, some winners, I, I learned to play blackjack. And I think this is a conversation that you and I have had. Yeah. And by understanding how to play blackjack well, I understood not only the power of probabilities, but I also understood that if you just release the outcome from your mind, so, and why I'm saying that, I'm saying that what, what's going to happen in this hand, if you win or lose the hand, that doesn't matter. If you can get rid of that, just cut ties with that being your focal point and just focus on playing each hand well based on the probabilities and forget whether you lose the hand or win the hand, forget whether you're making money or losing money, just focus on playing. Well, if you do that in the long run, you're always going to come out ahead. So I think that is, yeah, when I, from your back, lips to God's ears, like that, like in trading in general, that's the way it works, which is a really good trader has a process from which they invest and trade. Um, and it should never be about the trade you're in, but rather the process from which you choose to trade. And uh, so uh, true words of wisdom coming from you, obviously from a blackjack perspective, but it, it is so applicable. It's, it's just the way... Uh, the way it all comes together, right? Yeah. And on my Twitter feed and in the comments of my YouTube channel, I always see people saying, well, if you wouldn't have been in the market over the last two, and we've all heard this, right? Yeah. If you wouldn't have been in Tesla uh, over the last uh, year or whatever, six months, you would have lost out on all these gains. You know, they always say that. Or if you would have sold XYZ stock, then you wouldn't have realized all these gains. Or if you would have sat out the market over the last five years, you wouldn't have realized all these gains. And you just hear that constantly. People need to divorce themselves from that mentality because that's the same thing as sitting at the blackjack table and you're there with your buddy. And your buddy, let's say, it has a 19. And you're, you're telling him, listen, dude, you want to stay on that, that you got a 19. There's a very low probability that if you hit, you actually win. Like, like just stay on a 19. Trust me. And he says, oh, you're just too conservative. You don't know what you're talking about. The Fed, I've got a Fed put on this hand and the Fed's going to bail me out and you're crazy. <laughs> so he goes ahead and hits, right? And then he gets a two and gets blackjack. Well, who was right and who was wrong? Of course, your buddy is going to look at you and say, oh, see, I told you, I told you if I wouldn't have hit on this too, then I wouldn't have got a blackjack. I would have missed out on all those gains. But yeah. from your standpoint, you're like, listen, go ahead and keep doing that over the next 10 years in the casino and see how and that works. See what's going to happen. See if that, yeah. see how that's working out for you. It's and it's the exact strategy. same way in the markets. If you sit there and try to, get fixated on what you would have made or if the market is going up or if the market is going down, you're just going to, 
you're 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 going to come out on the downside there. Or you're going to lose money, in my opinion. But if you just forget about all that stuff, it's fun to talk about. I love doing videos about it and just thinking it through. And uh, you know, intellectually, it's very uh, fascinating. But from an investment standpoint, and again, this isn't about trading. This is just you know, if you're a long-term investor, just get that out of your head. Focus on the basics. Focus on the fundamentals, on value, buying yeah. things when they're cheap. And also, too, I want to clarify that when I'm saying buying things when they're cheap, fr from my standpoint, I don't even look at something that could be considered cheap because in the future, they're going to be making a lot of money. So, again, let's go back to Tesla. Someone could argue that was a te that was a uh, Tesla bull that Tesla is cheap right now. Because in 10 years, they're going to be doing this, 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 and that. And based on all of this stuff that's going to happen in the future, well, their share price is cheap. See, I don't do that. And, and again, this goes back to business. When I was in the world of buying and selling businesses, and, and I'm not talking about big, huge corporations. I'm just talking about gas stations and you know businesses for under $2 million. Yeah. You, you would never, ever, ever pay for let's say you've got a seller, right? You're going back and forth with the business broker and the seller is sitting there telling you about how great their business is going to be. And they have all these pro forma financials and P and L's and income statements. And you're just like, I don't care. Like I'm not paying for what your business is going to be. I'm paying for what your business is right now. So if, if your P and L is this, Okay, well, that, that's what I'm paying you for on, on your profit right now. And I'll pay you a right. multiple on that, but not on a, a multiple on some crazy numbers that may or may not happen in the future. And I think I got into that mindset so much by analyzing and, and getting in that world of buying and selling these small businesses that I was able to train my brain. So it's very easy for me to segue into seeing things the same way with investments. I did a, a whiteboard video the other day where I was trying to convey this message to my audience. And I was saying, think about buying a McDonald's, right? If you're going in there buying a McDonald's, are, are you really concerned with what the price of the McDonald's is going to be if you could sell it in the next week or the next no. two months? No, you're not. That's not even like you're not even considering that. The only thing you're doing is you're looking at the PL and you're saying, okay, great. I got to take on XYZ amount of debt to buy this thing. So my my servicing the debt's gonna cost me this much. Okay. They're they're netting this much. Okay, that means I'm gonna put this much in my pocket for how much I've got to take out of my pocket to buy the business in the first place. Is that a good return? Yes right. or no. And then if the answer is yes. Then what I would used to try to do is I'd try to buy a dollar for 50 cents. And that's what I still try to do today with the in, with investing the in the markets or whatever I'm doing. So if let's say their ask price is a million bucks. Well, I'm going to try to get that thing at 750 and yeah. I'm going to do whatever I can to get that. And that, you know, that you, you play a lot of games with that in the um, due diligence process. We won't get into that. Yeah. I won't share all my secrets. But now, <laughs> but now what I do is I, you can't do the same thing, obviously, because yeah. it's not like if, if Apple shares are trading at 200, it's not like you can somehow get them at 150. But what I'll do is I'll try to look for uh, these opportunities in the market where that, that dollar is trading at 50 cents. And just because of who knows, like, like as an example with, with Volkswagen, let's say, remember when they had that big thing where they tried to uh, pull the wool over the eyes of the, the regulators with their diesel and something like that, you know, a big, huge PR thing. So their share price, you know, if it was cheap, then that's something that I might consider going back to March as an example, Patrick, um, when when uh, oil was really crashing and everything was crashing back then, uh, I went in and I, you know, I remember listening to a podcast with Eric saying, and he was talking about he thinks the price of oil could go down to like 10. And it, there it was right around 20. I think this was might have been before it went to negative 40. Right. And I thought I was listening to Eric. I was listening to everyone on Macro Voices and Art Berman. I was trying to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. I said, yeah, I, I kind of see how it could go down 
below 20. But then I said, listen, the bottom line is it could go to 20 or it could go to 10. It could go to five. But the fact of the matter is anytime it gets below 30, if you look at a historic chart adjusted for inflation, it's cheap. It's cheap. Right. And I, I, I may think the market may go down further, but that's not what is that's not going to make me pull the trigger if I'm staying true to my investment framework. So although I thought oil most likely would continue to go down, I still went in and bought. And I, I bought the producer, I bought Shell and a couple others. But I went in and bought there. So that's a great example of me totally ignoring what I thought the price would do and just buying it just because it's cheap and letting the chips fall where they may. And that's another example of when I'm trying to look at tr buying a dollar for 50 cents. What most people do is they try to buy a dollar for three dollars, hoping that it goes to five dollars? Buy high to sell higher, for sure. Like the yeah. that's the the, but it, you know there's there's an entire school of investing that is that is focused on that methodology, and you know everyone has their own own way of engaging the market, but you truly have that value investor approach. To, to your methodology. Listen, George, I actually want to talk to you about a bunch of your episodes and things like that that you had. Well, first of all, why don't we start with this? Now, you, you gave us a great history of what you're all about, but uh, you started the Rebel Capitalist Show on, uh, at uh, georgegammon.com. And um, like, first of all, why don't you give us a quick summary of uh, why you started it and, and what what's it all about and, and what what is it that you're trying to accomplish with it, and then uh, and then we'll jump into talking about the Fed and the QE and all sorts of other really cool things. So why don't you give us a quick summary? Yeah, sure. Well, I started doing real estate in Columbia, and that it's kind of an extension of the past story. In 2019, and I started doing that in 2015. In 2019, I had a whole team here. We we're doing flips. We we're doing the exact same stuff that you see on all those reality shows in the United States, like Flip right. or Flop or Fixer Upper. And I thought to myself, well, man, I mean, we're doing this anyway. Why not just turn it into a TV show? And then I'll just figure out how to monetize a TV show later. It was just that typical entrepreneurial mindset, yeah. just shoot first and ask questions later. <laughs> and I had no clue how to produce a TV show, of course. I just thought it'd be a good idea. So I just pitched the local station here in Medellin. Uh, the station's called Telemedellin. And they're like, long story short, they said, yeah, it's a good idea. If, if you want to produce it, we'll put it on air. And then we'll split the, the commercials and the profits and stuff. And I said, yeah, let, let's do it. And of course, I was telling them, oh, yeah, this show is going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be great. And then when they say yes, I was walking out with my assistant and with the couple people that were working for me. And I'm like, OK, well, now we got to figure out how to produce a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> and we had about two weeks, but we just, you know, it was just uh, it was, anyway, a lot of fun. Did the TV show. That was a big success. Everyone loved it. I had some great editors, great camera people. We got done in the first season. I didn't really like dealing with the network too much. And we were kind of in that time frame between the first and the second season. So that's when I started the YouTube channel. And initially the YouTube channel, I was going to make it about real estate investing because that's what I knew. And uh, but but going back to 2012, although I had been investing mostly in real estate, my passion was macro. And just talking about investing and and I mean, I was just a diehard, as you know, fan of of macro voices and helping you guys out with macro voices live. And that that's what I was really passionate about. And so that's what I was always listening to the podcast. And whenever I was uh, in a conversation with someone, it would I would never really like talking about real estate. I mean, you talk about it here and there. It's OK. But I wanted to talk <laughs> about the Fed. I wanted to talk about quantitative easing and all these things. So I. We did a f maybe 20, 30 videos, and then I'm like, listen, this is happening with like the repo market or something like that. I'm like, I got to do a video on this. I just I know it's probably going to flop, but I just I got to talk about this. So I did a video on macro and I forgot the specific topic. But of course, that video took off. Right. And I'm like, wow, this is cool. Great. So I did a couple more and those videos were wildly popular where the real estate videos weren't popular at all. And so then I started in the whiteboard and everyone loved that. So I just kept doing it. And it was a great fit because 
it was it just happened to be what people wanted to hear and what the YouTube algorithm liked. And it's what I like talking about. So that was the genesis. And why I keep doing it is because I just I would be talking about this anyway. So why not just kind of film myself doing it? And I absolutely love talking to people like you and Eric and Jeff Snyder and Luke Groman and Brent Johnson and Juliet DeClerc and Art Berman and uh, Rick Rule, Doug Casey, Peter Schiff. I mean, the other day I interviewed Robert Kiyosaki, for heaven's sakes. Wow. And this is, you know, my YouTube channel's only been up for like know, nine months, 10 months, uh, under a year. So it's just been an amazing journey. And it's just every single day, it's awesome because you can wake up and you're excited about what you're going to do. And now I'm doing some other things and I've actually set up a second YouTube channel that it's not, uh, it's actually live, but uh, none of the videos are up because we're building like a 70 video library. And that's going to be more about vlogs and real estate investing and personal liberty, freedom, getting a second passport, uh, offshore bank account, stuff like that. So uh, that was kind of how we got to where we are today. Nice. So you and you've you've been releasing a whole wave of these videos. So uh, why don't we get into some markets and talk about some macro here? Uh, yeah, because you you have some pretty strong opinions on what's going on at the Fed with the QE and the Fed bailouts and how this is impacting bank reserves and other stuff. So uh, why don't you kind of talk us through in your more, some of your most recent videos, like what you were talking about and what's your general view on how this is all uh, shaping up? Well, if we're going to start talking about the Fed, I hope you got a beer. <laughs> I've got you, you a got beer. beer <laughs> I've actually almost finished this one. I'm going to have to go get another one, clearly. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You want to get out the beer bong when we start talking about the oh, Fed. You or you got to get out the shots or something like that. <laughs> On my videos, I, I always say it's stiff drink time. And so <laughs> that, that, it's stiff drink time right now or another beer time for, for Patrick. So going into the Fed, some of my more recent videos, I think. Something that's really interesting right now is the TGA. And I don't know if you guys have been talking about this on Macro Voices or maybe Lynn talked about this. So I apologize if this is redundant. But I think it's just how this is going to play out between now and the election. Yeah. It, I, I think whatever, however it plays out, there's going to be fireworks. And... Yeah. One thing, you know, going back six months, we had this back and forth with Trump and Powell, where Trump, was, you know, he's always critical and just ripping him on Twitter and kind of being a jerk and trying to push him one way and saying he's an idiot and all these things. You got to think that Powell, although he keeps his composure for obvious reasons, when he's reading those tweets, he's probably he's probably getting pissed. I mean, you could see the smoke coming out of his ears and he's like this SOB, blah, 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 blah. And you if you look at a chart of the TGA and there's the the chart, the Treasury General account, excuse me, going back prior to 2008, you see that it would fluctuate between like two and five billion dollars, billion with a B. What happened in 2008, just to give it some context is the TGA went from the commercial banking system and the Fed went to the Treasury and said, hey, listen, guys, if you could do us a huge favor and bring your bank account into the Fed, that would help us out a lot because then we'd have better control over the amount of bank reserves in the system. And back then, remember, they were probably very worried about uh, inflation. They, I think this might have been before... They set up uh, IOR, or IOER. So they're thinking, okay, yeah. we're going to flood the system with bank reserves. How on earth uh, to buy these treasuries to keep the long end of the curve down? How are we going to get interest rates above zero? And so they said, listen, Treasury, bring the TGA into the Fed. So if you, so what happens is if there's any dollars going into the TGA, those are bank reserves that are coming out of the banking system. Is how that works. But if the TJ spends money into the economy, then that means there's more bank reserves in the system. 
And if you're kind of scratching your head right now saying to yourself, okay, well, that sounds a lot like quantitative easing. You're right. It is. It's almost the exact same thing as quantitative easing. But when the TGA does it, they're not just creating additional bank reserves. They're also creating additional bank deposits in the real economy. And this is what's so fascinating because when the Fed does QE, they're just printing up bank reserves. It's like a, like an asset yeah. swap, like Snyder always says. Yeah. They're just printing up bank reserves and they're giving that to XYZ primary dealer for a mortgage-backed security, for a treasury, whatever. So, But it doesn't really change anything other than there's just more bank reserves under the Fed's mattress, if you will. That's how I always look at it in my videos. I call it the Fed bed. It's like putting a trillion dollars under your mattress. If it doesn't get out into circulation, it doesn't do anything. It's just- yeah, It it's, can't be inflationary when it's- static, Right. It's not going to create price inflation in the real economy because generally what does that is the commercial banking system, at least the majority of it. But with the TGA, with the treasury spending money into the economy, that's creating more bank, actually uh, bank deposits- therefore directly increasing M2 money supply, where if the Fed does the bank reserves, then although you do see a correlation there, the banking system has to take action. They have to do something in order to increase M2 money supply in the broad economy to get that, hopefully, that, that well, hopefully if you're the Fed, uh, to get their target inflation rate. So that's the big difference. So now the Treasury went from two to five billion in their account. When Trump came into office, they bumped that up to like 200 to 400 billion. So if you think this through, if the treasury has 400 billion in their account and they spend that into the economy, just boom, let's say in one month, that is quantitative easing like we have never seen it before well maybe prior to the 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 virus like we'd never seen it before you go back to qe3 qe3 was i mean correct me if i'm wrong i think it was like 80 billion a month so they could drop 400 billion boom just like that think what that would do to the stock market or to the expansion of the balance sheet capacity for the primary dealer banks and then what they could lend the hedge funds and the financial institutions. So if you look at the TGA now, it's up to 1.6 trillion, trillion with a T. Yeah. And I think what happened or what could have happened, I, and I'll put on my tinfoil hat here and I'm, I'll admit <laughs> that no problem. But if you go back to the repo spike, I, I think that could have been the treasury or the administration, whoever is calling the shots there. They're they're uh, they're pulling money out of the bank reserves or out of the system, so there's fewer bank reserves to force the Fed to come in and supply the reserves or to supply the liquidity that is needed for the system. Right. Because back then, Trump and Powell were going back and forth and back. Well, you shouldn't do quantitative tightening. You, you should be lowering interest rates. There should be more liquidity, blah, blah, blah. So that could have been the Treasury like playing a game of chicken with the Fed. So the repo spike Fed comes in. They say, OK, fine, fine, fine. You win. We'll come in with all of this liquidity. Then you have the, the virus come in. So the, the Fed has to come or in their eyes, they have to come to the rescue. So if you're the Treasury, you can just sit back and not spend a dime and just let the taxes and all these uh, the, the Treasury auctions. You can, Of course, you spend a little bit of money, but you can just let your account grow and grow and grow. So you're sucking more and more bank reserves out of the system. And you know it's not really going to matter because the Fed is creating so many bank reserves by taking their balance sheet from under four trillion up to seven trillion. So now you have this war chest, as Luke Groman calls it, where you can spend that into the economy prior to the election to try to win the election by basically giving a, a, a sugar rush to the economy and potentially the stock market. And where it gets super interesting 
is how does the Treasury deliver this? Well, most likely through another round of stimulus checks. Well, what did people do with the last round of stimulus and their additional unemployment? A lot of them set up these Robin Hood accounts <laughs> and started buying Nikola or they started buying Hertz after they had filed bankruptcy. So yeah. think about what happens if they've got $1.6 trillion that they need to, or well, not that they need to, but if, if they think that they need to spend this to win the election. And by the way, Trump is way behind in the uh, in the polls. From, I don't really follow it too much, but just from yeah. what I've heard, Trump is way behind Biden. So but he, he was also behind Hillary, too. Right. So, yeah, there we'll you go. Him. There you <laughs> we'll go. But he could just be kind of playing his hand and he's got this ace up his sleeve. So two months or a month or who knows, prior to the election, they just start raining down helicopter money. So that's going into the economy. Everybody's getting these stimulus checks saying, oh, my gosh, well, all my friends hate Trump and I would never admit voting for him. But, man, I mean, I'm getting a thousand bucks a month. I'm getting I mean, my my uh, my purchasing power has improved dramatically and I'm on unemployment. Man, maybe I should vote for this guy again. And then, of course, that's creating additional bank reserves at the same time, just like the Fed doing quantitative easing, expanding the balance sheet capacity of the primary dealer banks and potentially making the stock market continue to, uh, continuing uh, or keeping it going up while at the same time those people are taking the additional M2 money supply and dumping it right into their Robinhood account to buy more and more shares. So you so, you can envision so this George, thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. What, what's your what's no, but what's your what's your no, yeah, no, but what, what's your intuition on this? Like, do you do you think that uh, that the, this uh, can just keep going out up until the elections? Like, do you do you think that this uh, th there's going to be that this rally is not going to be checked and that that they can keep this thing going? I think they can. Of course, it's about probabilities, and I don't know. If I'd give it a 10%, if I'd give it a 20%, I'm not sure, but it's it's definitely possible. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, they're spending $1.6 trillion into the economy. And I know I talked to Lynn about this the other day, and she said they came out with a statement saying that their goal at a certain period of time, I think it was after the election, was to have at least $800 billion in the account. But I mean, you know how they are. They can say anything in between now and then. I mean, who knows what they do? They just pretty much, they've abandoned all the rules. I mean, look at what the Fed's done with the Federal Reserve Act. I mean, are you yeah. kidding me? They're just making a mockery of it. They're just completely ignoring it with these special purpose vehicles and all of these things. You know, one um, Macro Voices episode that I really, really love, I mean, I love all of them, but one that really sticks in my mind is the last interview that uh, Eric did with Dr. Lacey Hunt. And, yeah. you know, Eric, I, I was just Eric did such a brilliant job in, in yeah. this interview. And I know how hard that is because I I do interviews myself where I'm interviewing all these people and it's not as easy as it looks. But Eric, you know, he, he just subtly kept trying to push Dr. Hunt saying, OK, well, I understand what you're saying, but it, because Dr. Hunt's thing was based on the Federal Reserve Act the way it is now the Fed can't really spend money directly into the economy. So Dr. Hunt uh, defined that as money printing. You and I would probably define money printing as just creating bank reserves, but I don't think that's how Dr. Hunt uh, defined it. He defined it as the Fed actually spending money directly into the economy like the, like the Treasury does. And that was kind of the tipping point for him, where if he, he was a deflationist up until that point, but if the Fed crossed that Rubicon, he went from being a deflationist to like a hyperinflationist. Like th there's no passing go. You just go from zero to, to 10 right there. We're not, yeah. he passes the 1970s, all of that. You just go from one to the other. And so his point was that the, the, that the way the rule is right now, the Fed can't do that. And Eric kept pushing him, saying, look at what the Fed's been doing. They've been totally ignoring the Federal Reserve Act and at least the spirit of it for sure. And so that was Eric's point, that I don't know that the Federal Reserve Act is going to prevent them from doing that. And I, I completely agree with Eric. I, I think the Fed and the government, they just do whatever they want now. I mean, they, they ignore well, the Well, I mean, it, what, they, what you want to think is, well, George, like I was going to say, like what ends up happening is, is that 
uh, it's like who it, who is going to object to them breaking the rules, right? So like there might be a law and exactly it says that this right. is the way it's written, but if the, if it's in the benefit of the government and it's in the benefit of the Fed and if most people will benefit from the fact that uh, their assets are stable in this environment, who's the one who's going to object that they're breaking the rules? Yeah, exactly. So in going back to our original point there, I, I put out a tweet yesterday or something like that. I said the future headline could be Dow at 50,000 while unemployment is at 50 percent. <laughs> And, you know, it's kind of that's a, your tin hat right there. You've got you've got the tin hat going. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but you can see it because, um, oh, you know what? I it was a, in response, Patrick, to a headline that I saw on Bloomberg or something like that, saying that last quarter was the best quarter in the stock market since 1987. Well, and so that that's kind of why I tweeted it that. Conv oh, conveniently. God, conveniently the bottom came right at the end of the first quarter and so you're measuring from the exact lowest point to the next highest point right and so it's convenient from a perspective because if the market bottom in february and uh, it would have been a whole different scenario but anyway yeah but think uh, about that if we have another if we have a second wave here or a first wave in a lot of and i'm i'm apologize for the international yeah. viewers i'm being us centric but if we have a, a second wave or a first wave in a lot of these states, like we're seeing in Florida, Arizona, et cetera, you could imagine if it gets, not, obviously I, I'm not hoping this, but it gets so bad that it, unemployment, I mean, it, it popped up to what, 20? And you know, as well as I do, the way they measure unemployment is totally bogus. It's just as yeah. bad, if not worse than the CPI. Political fiction. Yeah. yeah if, you, if you measured the unemployment rate the way they used to, it would be up, uh, or at least the way they did in the depression, it would be at least at those levels. Do you know, I did this, uh, a video on this the other day that I got a big kick out of it. You know, the way that they measured inflation back in the 1930s or the, the way they retroactively measured it, they excluded a lot of government jobs because they, they felt as though they weren't even productive. So you might. So if you had a government <laughs> job, you were considered unemployed. <laughs> and I thought, wow, they really hit the nail on the head. I wish we were as smart today as they were back then. But my point is, if you measure inflation correctly, if we get a second wave, you could see unemployment, maybe not getting to 50, but darn close. And then you combine that with this 1.6 trillion in the TGA. And if they bam, unload that in two weeks or a month, I don't know. I mean, maybe not 50,000 and 50%, but maybe, I don't know, 35 and 35. I mean, it's a fun thought experiment. It, it, well, you know, it'll, it'll be entertaining uh, to, to watch, how, to see how it plays out. Um, but let's, uh, let's move on because you, um, you did a little uh, video on the swap lines. Why don't you yeah. talk us through uh, what, you, what you were uh, trying to explain? I was trying to think through how the liquidity could get to where it needs to go. So if we think of this from a, a dollar milkshake theory standpoint, Brent Johnson, we, we've all heard this and it's an, an incredible theory and it's very well thought out. It's basically there's so much dollar denominated debt outside of the United States and the euro dollar system is breaking down. Uh, Snyder talks about this going all the way back to 2008. So there, there's not enough dollars for the amount of debt. And if you create more debt, to Brent's point, you're just creating more demand for dollars. So how do you get out of this vicious cycle? So everyone says, well, Brent, don't worry about it. The Fed set up these swap lines so these uh, corporations can get as much liquidity as they need. Not really, because if you actually dig a little deeper and understand how the swap lines work, it's a lot more complex. And so what happens when the Fed sets up a swap line, let's say with the BOJ, the, the Fed will just create additional bank reserve. The BOJ has an account with the Fed. They create bank reserves dollar denominated. And then the BOJ does the same thing for the Fed in yen. And if there is an, let's call it XYZ Japanese Corp, if they're needing dollars because they're just drowning in their dollar denominated debt, they don't have any dollars coming in because global trade has come to a standstill because of the virus for whatever reason, 
then they would most likely have to go to a, a commercial bank. The commercial bank goes to the BOJ and then the BOJ says, OK, fine, you can access the swap line. They access the swap line through an intermediary bank that, that goes to the Fed. That's where they get the, the money to back up the newly created dollar loans that they would give to XYZ Corp. So uh, a lot of people say, well, why don't they, if the euro dollar system, if they just create dollars out of thin air, why don't they do it? Because they don't have the balance sheet capacities, just the short answer there. But still, it goes back to the problem that the Fed has right now in getting money into the real economy to where they're reliant on the commercial banking system. So think about this. If you're a bank in Japan and you're looking at this XYZ Corp that doesn't have the, the cash flow, really, coming in to satisfy the dollar denominated debt, are you really going to give them a loan? Because it's not a liquidity issue. It's a solvency issue. And it yeah. goes, and just because you give them the loan, well, fine. But now they've got even more debt than they had before, but they don't have any more dollars coming in. And you could say, well, you know, maybe global trade goes back to where it was before. Well, fine, but they still had a problem. And then you have to weigh the probabilities of global trade going back when, once we get this uh, virus in the rearview mirror, you've got all this, all these people politically and in society pushing for things like deglobalization. So if you have all these supply chains coming back to the United States, well, there's going to be fewer and fewer dollars getting outside of the United States. So this Japanese corp is going to be in the exact same spot in a month, in a year, whatever. So the bank is going to look at that. They're like, they're going to lose money and we're on the hook. And then you say, well, the central bank could come in and bail out the corporations just like the Fed did in the United States. But that doesn't really work either because if you look at the statement by the Fed, the BOJ in this case, in this case would be on the hook for the dollars. So if XYZ Corp goes bust, the, the BOJ is still on the hook. And so does the BOJ really want to, to, to bro- provide that when they're holding the bag? Most likely not. So you see this daisy chain of events that would have to happen in order for the entities outside of the United States to actually get the dollars that are being provided by this swap line. And it's like, that's not going to happen. Like that's, that's never, ever going to happen. It's almost like the Fed would need to directly bail out that individual Japanese corporation and how they would do that. I don't know, but maybe that's why they're going in now and buying all of these bonds of corporations that aren't even American. And I understand they've got factories and they've got uh, facilities in the United States, but I don't know. Is, is that a indirect way to bail out these foreign corporations because the swap lines aren't working? Um, it's probably a good, uh, good, uh, good, um, good thought process. Yeah. It's, it's, it's probably an interesting topic for another whiteboard video. Well, for sure. Well, you know what? Listen, I mean, we could probably talk for two, three hours, but the reason we don't have to is because you have your own channel and you talk about these things. Like how many, how many times a week do you release a video? I, did tr- I try to, do, yeah, I usually do three interviews for the Rebel Capitalist show where I interview people like yeah. you and all the guys on Macro Voices. And then I do two whiteboard videos per week, sometimes three, wow. usually two. So anyone who wants more of George, uh, we'll, we'll have him tell you where to find him in a moment. But I want to leave with two questions here, um, you know, and because, I mean, it's... It, when, when people hear you talk and, and they hear you, uh, they, uh, many people make a lot of assumptions, but what is this something people seem to misunderstand about you? Is there, is there something that you feel that you, you want to explain to people? The first thing I'd like them to understand is I'm not that smart and that I'm no smarter than anyone else average intelligence at best. And the reason I want people to understand that is because if I can get this stuff, you can too. And we are heading into times right now that are unknown to say the least. And you can either be prepared or you can be a victim. And I would Mm -hmm. prefer people be prepared. And in order to do that, so you can set yourself up now 
for the future. And when I say set yourself up, I'm talking about your your finance, your finances, your portfolio. I th- you you've got to understand this stuff. You've got to understand macro. You've got to understand how the Fed works. And I think people get intimidated by it because they just don't understand the esoteric language. Because we talk about all these things that it's like any business, really. It's got its own language. And if you don't understand the language, then you think as though you could never comprehend what's actually being said. But that's not true. So it just, I, I don't know, if it's my channel or Macro Voices or Real Vision, just try to power through or follow these guys on Twitter as well. They're very, very active. And try to understand as much as you can, realizing that, it, that it, if you don't understand it now, it's just due to a lack of understanding of the terminology. It's not because you don't have the brain power to comprehend it. And I'm a perfect example of that. If I can get it, trust me, you can get it. <laughs> All right. Well, George, we always like to leave with the, with the one question. Uh, and I ask you a simple thing that if you could go back in time and give advice to the young George that is just uh, uh, graduating uh, college, and uh, give them, them some, a little bit of advice on uh, what would you tell that young George? Number one, I'd say the online business model is far superior than the brick and mortar. So when you're an entrepreneur, considering uh, consider making some investments in, in your own personal business into marketing online. Uh, it, it's just a no-brainer. And I also, of course, would have told myself to buy things when they're cheap. So I wouldn't have made that mistake in in Ecuador. And then I would also tell myself, as soon as you start making a little bit of money, try to figure out a way through your investments where you can get you can buy investments that pay you enough to to handle your monthly bills and do that as quickly as you possibly can. So as an example, when I was an entrepreneur, uh, you know, my monthly net would be call it 10, 20 grand, something like that. I was never, ever thinking about, well, how can I take all this money I'm making and invest it into dividend paying stocks or real estate? So every month I, from my investments, I can have this $20,000 coming in to where I'm not having to deplete any of the money that I'm making from the business or any of the cash flow or any of my savings. And I never really thought about it. I just was hyper focused on making sure the business grew and grew and grew and more money, more money, more money. But if I would have focused on that in addition to what I was doing, I think I, it would have served me well. And I didn't start thinking that way until 2012. And I think how that may yeah. be applicable to uh, other people or younger people, if go out there and house hack if you can. And, and or just take the concept of house hacking and apply that to whatever you can. So house hacking is when you go out there, you buy a triplex and you have the other two, your renters are paying the mortgage. So then you can take all that money that you would have spent on rent. Basically, they're paying your bills for you. You, you got the your investment yeah. is covering your monthly nut from the standpoint of your housing cost. Then you can take that housing cost or what you would have spent on rent or mortgage, and then you can start investing it. You can start saving it. You can start building up 10, 20 grand so you can start your own online business or maybe start a, an investment portfolio or start trading, doing all these things. And and that's that's so that's the mindset that I would have encouraged my younger self to get in ASAP. There you go. Well, that's great advice. So, George, for all of our listeners that want to learn more about you and follow you, where can they find you? Tell, give them your uh, details. Sure. You can just find me on Twitter, George Gammon. Last name is G-A-M-M-O-N. First name is typical spelling of George. It's not Jorge, although a lot of my buddies <laughs> call me that. <laughs> and the website is georgegammon.com or the Twitter, or excuse me, the YouTube channel is just George Gammon. All right. Well, George, I can't thank you enough for uh, a great interview and uh, I look forward to staying in touch. Oh, likewise. Thanks for having me, Patrick.